Hey, this is Brother Mike back on uh, the podcast on twitch.tv. Thanks for joining. Welcome to hardcorechristianity.com and the Arizona Deliverance Center. Please remember our healing service tonight at six o'clock at the Arizona Deliverance Center. It's going to be a, a, a good turnout. And uh, the Dream Center is a uh, Christian rehabilitation center in Phoenix. It's the largest one in the state. Uh, they're bringing a, a bus load of their people tonight. So it's going to be a really interesting evening. Peter Valenzuela is going to be speaking. Peter and I also speak over at the Dream Center. Um, he's over there four times a month. I'm over there uh, twice a month, first and third Tuesday of every month. I'm at the Dream Center. I do teaching and uh, I do some really hard teachings over there. I'm real hard on the addicts, very hard on them. And um, they love the abuse. They just love being told the truth in no uncertain terms. And that's the only way you can help an addict. You got to tell them the truth in no uncertain terms. No hesitations of any kind. Please remember we have two live services every week at the Deliverance Center. <clears throat> Thursday and Friday nights at 7 o'clock. We have two Zoom services, one for the ladies Monday at 6.30, and for everybody, Wednesday evenings at 6 o'clock. January 13th, excuse me, July 13th is our children's deliverance service. If you have a preteen who needs to be delivered, please, uh, please bring your children to that service. We definitely... You won't believe some of the blessings those kids get. The Holy Ghost jumps on them fast. He sure loves kids, doesn't he? Yeah. I wanted to share something interesting with you today. Let's take a look at the John uh, chapter 5. And uh, Jesus says some very remarkable things in that chapter. Uh, in fact, the whole book of John is mind-blowing. But if you look at John chapter 5, Jesus said something that appears really crazy. He said, Verily I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself. And that's the Greek word, apo. It means from himself. The Son can do nothing from himself. But what he sees, Father doing. Greek word poieo, it means father practicing repetitive behaviors, a practice of behaviors, not just a one time thing. And then Jesus said, Whatever I see the father practicing, whatever those things are, I also practice them. And he said, because this, the Father loves the Son and shows him everything. Everything he's doing, Greek word poieo again, practicing, verse 20, he will show the Son. And what Jesus was saying there was, later on he said it to us, as my Father sent me, I am sending you. What Jesus was saying there was, I don't do anything on my own. I follow Father's footsteps. And I see him doing something. I hear him saying something. So I do what he does. And I say what I hear him saying. I only do those things what, that I see Father doing. And I only say those things what I hear Father saying, because the Father loves the Son and shows him everything. Wow. What do we got going here? Well, here's what we got. If you go over to Matthew chapter 8 in verse, verse 1, this is a familiar story to everybody. But at the time this happened 2,000 years ago, Nobody really knew the full ramifications of it, nor did they know what was actually happening. It says, when Jesus came down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him, and behold, a, 
a leper came worshiping him. And he said, Lord, if you want to, Greek word thalo, want to, if you want to, you can make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and said, I want to, thalo, I want to be clean, be clean. Okay, that's the Greek Greek verb, katharizo, it means to be cleansed, to clean something off so that it looks new. But what was what was actually happening there? Well, what we know we know now is as that leper was approaching him, father was looking out of the eyes of the son, and Jesus saw father reaching out, touching the leper. Jesus through through discernment and the gift of knowledge saw father reaching out and touching that dying leper with obviously no fear of a contaminated disease. So when Jesus saw that, he then reached out and touched the dying leper. Then what they didn't know was he, Jesus heard father saying, I want to be cleansed. So then when he heard that, Jesus said, I want to be cleansed. I only do those things I see my father doing. I only speak those things I hear my father saying. This this interaction with this dying leper was a perfect example that no one knew was happening. And then the next story is in verse five, the the legendary story of the centurion. He comes to Jesus and explains to him that his son back home is dying and he wants him to heal him. And Jesus said immediately, instantaneously, well, let's go, I'll, 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 I'll go help you. And then the centurion makes this spectacular statement that he was a man of authority and he told these people to do that and he told those people to do this and they immediately did it because he was the boss. What he was saying was, I'm the boss in the natural world, but you are the boss in the spirit world and you don't need to come to my house. You can speak it from where you are here into the spirit world and the miraculous blessing of healing will go to my son at my home in the natural world. But what really happened was father was looking out and saw this centurion right up on his stallion and heard what he said to Jesus. Father heard it. And Jesus heard father say, let's go heal him. I want to heal him. Just like he said with the leper, it was an instantaneous reaction. And here we can see an exhibit of, in psychology, you would call it a forensic autopsy, so to speak. You're doing an analysis, a psychological analysis on God. What kind of personality, temperament does father have? What kind of person is he really? Why do you need to know that? Well, because in the Old Testament, the sun wasn't around. And in the Old Testament, everybody got a very kind of a bad view, a skewed view of father because he was very hard on sin and his judgments were very stern. And so people got an idea, and the Muslims have it today, that God is a person who hates sinners and hates sin and is very judgmental on those things. And in John, particularly in John, more than all the other books in the Bible, we get a, a, a peek behind the curtain, so to speak, 
kind of like you saw in the Wizard of Oz. The Wizard of Oz was yelling and screaming up there, and Toto ran over and pulled that curtain back, and everybody got a peek behind the curtain, and they found out there actually was no Wizard of Oz. He did not exist. It's actually an old man with uh, gastroenteritis and arthritis standing there pulling letter levers. Here we're getting the curtain pulled back by the sun, showing what the real personality of father is. What's he really like? What kind of a person is he really? What, what's the psychology behind father? What kind of personality has he got? A lot of people want to know that. That's the biggest question in the world. What personality does God have? What kind of a person is he? What kind of personality temperament does he have? How does he interact with others? What are his emotional accoutrements? What's the deal with him? How does he how does he match up? What's he like really? Well, the Gospel of John couldn't be any clearer. John was the closest to Jesus of all the disciples. They were the best of, best of friends. You know, like he and Lad Jesus had disciples that he was closer to than others, James, Peter, and John. He had friends that he was closer to than others, for example, Lazarus. And here, the great apostle John is giving us a peek behind the curtain, psychologically and psychiatrically, an analysis of father. What is he really like? And as you know, the centurion's son was healed from that very moment. Jesus never went to his house. But he heard father say, we don't need to go to his house. Do as he said. I agree. He can be healed through the spirit world. And doesn't need a physical visitation. You see the miracle of... of uh, the ship in the sea was next, verse 23, Matthew chapter 8. You can see them toiling in the sea there. And uh, it says there arose a great tempest in the sea. That's the Greek word, uh, seismos. Seismos is an underwater earthquake, or what we would call a tsunami. An underwater earthquake occurred while the disciples were in the ship and Jesus was in the lower part of the ship taking a nap, taking a nap. In the middle of a total disaster, he's taking a nap. Now that appeared to be strange. It appeared to be that Jesus was either ignorant or indifferent, but actually he was setting an example because he saw Father resting during a trauma period. And that's exactly what happens to you in your life. When the trauma hits, when trauma hits you, father is at rest, knowing that if you release your faith, he will move huge. I told you this story a couple of years ago about the Holy Ghost and about the Father and the Son. Have you ever noticed, have you ever watched a professional wrestling match? WWE or WCW, whatever they call those things. I'm not a wrestling fan, but I've channel surfed at times and stopped on a wrestling match. And if you notice something, while the wrestlers are in the ring butchering each other, the crowd is going crazy. It's total hysterics like it was on the boat with Jesus in Matthew chapter 8 after the tsunami hit. They were panicking beyond belief. The ship was tilting like you wouldn't believe. Waves were coming over the ship. Extreme danger. They were panicking. They were going crazy. The people watching the wrestling match they're going crazy. 
you know, one wrestler does something to the other that's illegal while another wrestler distracts the ref. Oh, it's, it, it's a choreographed. Yeah. I mean, the wrestlers are great athletes, but that the process there is choreographed. They know what they're going to do before they do it. But anyway, the crowd buys into it hundred percent and they are going total bedlam. They're going crazy. But if you look up there at the top of the arena, they have what they call obviously sky boxes. And that's where, that's where the people, the multimillionaires, the owners of the managers of the wrestlers, the owners, they're all sitting up in the sky box there and they're just relaxing. They've got hors d'oeuvres and beautiful food laying around the, like a, almost like a banquet. They're all sitting there sipping scotch whiskey, fancy wines, champagne, and they're just sitting in their chairs watching the wrestling match and all the bedlam down down below. And some of them have got their feet up and they're not talking about wrestling. They're just kind of casually talking to each other. You know, how's your kid? How are they doing at Stanford? How's your son doing at Harvard? Oh, good. Uh, did you ever buy that yacht you were talking? Yeah, we got it now. Yeah, it's in Newport Beach. We got it there temporarily. Oh, okay. That's the, and they're just casually talking back and forth. Very common. They're not really looking down at the wrestlers. They know it's choreographed. They've seen it before. Man, they're cool. They've got $200, $200 Cuban cigars are about that long. And the Scotch whiskey comes up, ooh, and they're and they're wondering how their wife was doing shopping, at, you know, on Rodale Drive. Oh, she's doing fine today. She's buying some new clothes. They take another big drag off of there. They take a sip. They put their feet up. Everybody is cool. Meanwhile, down at the wrestling match, total bedlam. Everything's gone stark, raving crazy. Everything's going nuts, just like on the boat during the tempest in the sea. Seismus, the, the tsunami hit, and it's total panic. It's total panic. Which one's the Holy Ghost down down by the fans going crazy or the one in the sky box? Well, he's the one in the sky box. And I don't know if you've noticed it or not, but over the years, um, over the years, you've gone through some pretty tough trials, really tough. And there've been times you've been scared. You've been worrying. Uh, your family members have been scared. You've been confused. You had things that you didn't know was going on. You didn't know what was going on behind the scenes. You didn't know what was coming up next. It was a very stressful, difficult period for you. And during that period of time, the devil had hit you mentally, telling you, where's God? How come God's not helping you? What's wrong with God? He's all jacked up. He's screwed up. He doesn't care. He doesn't love you. He's not interested. And you get all these negative thoughts start pouring into your mind from this demonic oppression. And you're sitting there going, where in the world is God? What is going on? What is happening? In the meantime, you don't hear from God. The spirit of the Lord doesn't seem to be showing up. It's dead silent on that end. It's quiet on that end. And the reason for all of that and what you didn't realize and what you didn't understand, you, though all those owners and managers in the skybox are not saying anything. They're just relaxing. They're just cool as they can be. And there's a reason for that. There's a reason for it all. And I think you know what it is. The fight is fixed. The fight is fixed. The owners in the skybox, the managers, they already know the outcome of the match. The fight is fixed. The Holy Ghost is sitting there, appears to be totally uninterested and not doing anything. But what you don't realize is this trial you're going through, 
it's fixed. The fight is fixed. How's it fixed? In your favor. The Spirit of the Lord is sitting there knowing the fight is fixed. And so there's no reason to panic. Jesus was laying at the bottom of the ship, taking a nap. Why? The fight is fixed. The fight is fixed. And Jesus said to them, Oh, ye of little faith, don't you know the fight's fixed? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea. And there was a great calm. It's just like a pro wrestling match. You're managing a wrestler. You already know what's going to happen. We win tonight. We lose tonight. We win tomorrow night. We lose tomorrow night. They already know what the outcome is. Your deepest, darkest trials are exactly the same way. This fight is fixed in your favor, friend. You can't lose. Once again, in chapter 8 in Matthew 2, Two guys from Gergesenus, massively infected with demons, legions of demons. These two guys were homeless. They lived in tombs, sepulchers. They would live in a sepulcher with dead bodies. And they met Jesus. And everybody was petrified. They knew these two men were insane. They were crazy. When Jesus got off the ship and was faced with these two men, what was the first thing he did? Well, panic and call in tens of thousands of angels. Uh, start yelling at Father, help! Get, no. Jesus saw Father calm and cool as a cucumber. He saw Father watching these two maniacs come up to see Jesus. So Jesus then saw him cool, and so he remained calm. And both of them were delivered. In chapter 9 in, in Matthew, I hope you'll read Matthew 8 and 9. There's more miracles per sentence in those two chapters than there are anywhere in the Bible. You know the story of this one. A family brought a man that was uh, paralyzed. The Greek word is paraluticus. He had a spinal cord injury. He was on a cot. And his family brought him, his loved ones. They cared about him. They loved him. You know the story, they tore off the roof because they couldn't get in the front door, so they dropped him down in front of Jesus. And it says in verse 2, chapter 9, Jesus seeing their faith. He saw their faith. Well, that takes a lot of faith to tear up a roof and then drop it down, drop them down spontaneously. They had to haul him up on the roof. They went through a lot of work to get this poor guy on the roof and then more work tearing up the tile and put sending him down through the roof. But Jesus heard something when that guy came down. He saw their faith and he heard Father say something to him, which was interesting. I only say the things I hear my Father saying. I only do the things I see my Father practicing. Poyeo. He said to the sick of the palsy, the paralyzed man, Son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. Greek word, aphiomi, for forgiven, released from you. 
they're released from you. He said, be of good cheer, because he heard Father say that. Why? The guy was suffering from enormous levels of clinical depression. Jesus did an instant psychiatric autopsy on the guy and found out that his real problem wasn't his disability. It was his depression that stripped him of his faith and his hope and told him he needed to die. He wanted to die. His depression was extreme and he was hopeless. And Jesus saw that the healing wasn't the number one problem. The number one problem was his emotional state. Son, be of good cheer, he heard Father saying. Your sins are released from you. Then the scribes and Pharisees, having absolutely no concern whatsoever for this disabled person, and that's exactly like, those are exactly like most Christian churches. They don't have any concern for this person's mental illness. They have no concern for this person's physical disability. They they wouldn't know a demon if it bit them in the face and don't have any concerns about anybody being delivered. None. They just want to go on with their Christianity. So they accuse Jesus of blasphemy because he heard Father say, your sins are released from you. And when Jesus said what he heard Father say, they criticized Jesus, which in end, by extension, they were criticizing Jehovah. Jesus said, which is easier to release somebody from their sins or to heal their body? And back then, people thought it was easier to heal their body than to deliver them from their sins. Nowadays, we think it's easier for people to be forgiven of their sins than it is to get their bodies healed. But Jesus said, so that you might know that the son of man has power, Greek word exousia, authority. So you know that the son of man has authority on this earth to forgive sins, to release people from their sins, a fiamy. He turns to the sick of the palsy, the guy that was paralyzed, paraluticus, and he hears fathers say this, stand up, that's the Greek word egairo, means to stand up if you're sitting or laying down. Stand up. Take up your cross, Greek word iro. Pick up your cross and take it with you. Take your bed. Pick up your bed. See, his cross wasn't the bed, and it wasn't his disability. It was his depression. Had the depression not been cured, the healing wouldn't have taken place. Same is true today. People's unrenewed mind blocks their deliverance and their healing. If you can get the person to renew their mind and stop receiving negative thoughts and start using their mind for faith and faithful thoughts and truth, for you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. If you can encourage someone to do that, and if they make that turn and start to head that direction, the deliverance and the healing is up next. Which is easier for me to do? Release sins or heal? And then he turns to the guy and says, hey, stand up. Take up your cot and go home. And that's exactly what the guy did. He stood up and he went home. My my assumption is that his family that brought him there repaired the roof that they had torn up before they left. 
but I would have paid some serious money to be at their house that day when he walked in the door to see his family and his parents. I would have paid some real money to see that. You can imagine that was the most joyous and happiest home anywhere in the land of Israel, bar none. The shock, the glory, the joy of seeing that poor disabled guy come back home with his sins released from him. And oh, by by the way, secondarily, I'm walking now. And then in verse 8, it says, the multitudes marveled and glorified God that he had given such authority to men. Wow. Another miracle happens right after that one. These two chapters are so full of miracles, you can't even believe it. Jesus passed through the seat of customs, and guess who was sitting there? Matthew. Matthew was a tax collector, Greek word talones. It technically means a tax farmer, a money farmer, like like somebody who farmed crops. He didn't farm crops. He farmed money. And Jesus looked up at him and heard Father say, that's one of your disciples. I want him as a disciple. And Jesus said to him, follow me. I only speak what I hear Father saying. I only do what I see Father doing. Follow me. And then Matthew talks him into coming to his house because Matthew was rich. He had a lot of money. He said, I come to our house for dinner. And so all the other disciples came to Matthew's house and they sat down there for dinner. And the Pharisees came to him again and criticized him for hanging around a bunch of lowlifes, a bunch of nothings and nobodies. And Jesus said to them, people that are whole, Greek word is skuro. People who have the abilities, people who are able, is what he was saying. People who are able to do things on their own don't need a physician. If you can heal yourself, you don't need a physician. If you take some home remedies and you get better, you don't need to go to the doctor. If you've got something you can fix yourself, you don't need a doctor. Got a splinter, you take it out. You don't need to go to the emergency room. You fix it yourself. But but Jesus said, wait a minute. Father, I hear Father telling me, I don't need to see people who don't need anything. What I need to see people is, I need see, to see people who don't have anything and who need something. So Jesus said, I only, I go to those people who are sick not those who are well. And here you can see the same thing happening. In your life, friend, this fight you're facing right now is fixed. It's fixed. This thing's fixed. Yeah. I mean, even the toughest things are fixed, you know. Over the years, I've counseled many people with sex addictions. And I always take them through the same series of stages. And stage one is this one. If you're a porn addict, if you're gay, if you're trans, or you're non practicing gay or trans, or you are a non-practicing porn addict, or you're uh, an adulterer, you've got a sex addiction, but temporarily you're a non-practicing sex addict. If you're any of those things, I take them through phase one. Here's phase one. It's not you. It's not you. Okay. 
at some time in your past, a spirit, a sexual perversion spirit, got into your body. Now, they usually get in through open doors, usually sexual abuse, verbal abuse, physical abuse. They can also get in through uh, family trees that are chuck full of severe sin, severe sin, masonry, witchcraft, false religions, Mormons, Jehovah Witness, stuff like that. And these powerful demons enter the family tree and go down the tree. Sometimes hitting you in the womb. The reason that this is important is because the devil always tells people they were born that way. But in reality, the demon either got in at the womb or in childhood. So that their earliest memories are they were gay. They were trans. They, were, they had a hypervented sex drive. And it's all a fraud. So phase one is this. You have to understand that those desires, those urges are not yours. You are not born with them. God did not give them to you. The demons gave them to you. It was given to you. And it was not your fault. Children are not at fault for anything. So if they are abused and a door opens for that spirit to enter through fear, through terror, through anxiety, through physical pain, through emotional pain, the door opens, the spirit moves in. And so the first thing you have to understand is you must stop condemning yourself because those desires for same sex, those desires to transition to a girl when you're a boy, whatever the case may be, those desires did not come from you. They're not your desires. It's not you. And therefore, God wants you to stop condemning yourself. Stop condemning yourself. It's not you. And Father is saying to you, I want to help you. I understand why you feel that way. I understand where those desires and those urges came from. And I want to heal you. That's the first thing you have to learn. If you have any kind of unclean spirits of perversion, those demons transfer those urges to you. And that's why you think the way you do. That's why your body responds sensually and sexually the way it does. That's why you're a chronic masturbator. That's why you relapse so often. And once these spirits are removed, once they're removed, you're cured. And that's the purpose of deliverance, to help people who cannot help themselves That's the purpose of it, for giving you the freedom that Christ paid for you on the cross of Calvary. You are not gay. You're not trans. You're not a homo. They gave it to you. Abuse let it in. Your family trees, demons, got in. If you have a sex addiction or gender identity issues or trans issues or whatever it may be, send me an email, mike at hardcorechristianity.com, the miracle list. I will send it to you immediately today after my podcast. I'll send it right out. 
you have to do number one and number two on that list. Because any Christian who has any kind of a problem, not, not a severe problem like this or severe drug addiction or alcoholism, whatever. No, any Christian who has any kind of a need, they want God to repair for them. It will never happen as long as you see yourself unworthy and are condemning yourself. There is therefore now no what? Condemnation. Greek word, krino, judgment to those who are in Christ. God is not judging you for your sins if you are now a born again Christian. Now the devil will judge us, 2 Timothy chapter, what, is that 3? three at the bottom there. Yeah, he'll judge you if you keep on sinning, sure. You'll fall under the laws of God, which are what? The, the law of sowing and reaping. Yes, that will happen to you if you keep sinning, correct. But it's not God doing it. Your heavenly father is not judging you. He is not condemning you. Condemnation comes from the devil and creates guilt. Conviction comes from the Holy Spirit, which creates healing and deliverance. Conviction is the best thing you'll ever see. Condemnation is the worst. God's personality is just exactly as Jesus portrayed it. The Father loves the Son, gives him everything. And that's where Jesus is today. The last, virtually the last thing he said before he went home, the end of Matthew, he said, all authority, exousia, the Greek word, authority, not it's not power, dunamis, all authority is given to me in heaven and, <coughs> excuse me, upon the earth. All authority. Why? He had earned it. He earned it. He wasn't born in sin. He did not sin and lived a sinless life. He voluntarily submitted himself to the cross. It wasn't forced on him and he wasn't required to do it. It was a voluntary act based on his free will. He was butchered, slaughtered, and killed and murdered in cold blood on the cross of Calvary. The Holy Ghost raised him on the third day. Romans chapter 8. And at the ascension, he went up to where? The right hand of the Father. The right hand of God. The right hand is the authority side. He's the boss. And that's why the owners sit in the skybox sipping scotch whiskey and smoking Cuban cigars with their feet up while everybody else goes crazy. That's why the Holy Spirit appears to be doing nothing, hearing nothing, and he appears disinterested. That's all a lie. He sits there calmly as he can be because he knows the fight is fixed. The devil attacked you and didn't know he was being set up. He didn't know he was being set up. What really drives the devil nuts is when he's got somebody by the throat and they're, they've got these horrible problems, severe mentally ill, physically ill, financially ill, broken everything. He thinks he's finished the person off. He thinks it's over. And suddenly, the fight gets unfixed. And the Spirit of God moves and again causes him nothing but heartache and misery. You got to remember. 
And if you forget it, you're going to die. You're going to die with no blessings and nothing's going to happen. You got to remember this. You got to reach out with your faith. You got to understand this. The fight is fixed. See you next time.